Well, hey there, everyone. I'm Ellen Wells, editor at large uh, for Green Profit Magazine and editor of the world famous Buzz E newsletter, the weekly industry news and generally fun stuff that you cannot live without, right? I'd like to welcome you to yet another ball publishing webinar. This one is five trending marketing tips for IGCs. You'll note that it's a retail topic, not a grower topic, which is why I'm here as your co-host and MC for today's event. Uh, we relegated boss man Chris Beatty's to uh, the background. Uh, he's pushing buttons and stuff behind the scenes. Um, Chris, you can probably say hi, but no one's going to hear you, just, <laughs> just to let you know. So I said we because I've got a co-host here uh, in, in today's uh, webinar, and that is the ever-sparkling Jen Polans uh, in the image right below me, uh, managing editor for Green Profit. How are you today, Jen? I'm well, Ellen. Thank you. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm digging out of a little bit of snow. How's uh, uh, Where are you broadcasting from today? Oh, well, I wish I could tell you that I was broadcasting from my lovely vacation home in St. Lucia or some great location like that, but I'm not. I'm at my home office in Cleveland, Ohio, very snowy and very cold. Yes. Oh, no. Well, I'm in my home office in Boston, Massachusetts. And since we're both uh, in our home offices, you know, things will happen. Uh, I, I see that my cat just jumped in the window again over here to my left. And, you know, the mailman might ring. Uh, the dog might, might bark. Um, all sorts of things might happen. So we apologize for that in advance. And I hope it's entertaining if it does happen. <laughs> right? I'm sure it will be. <laughs> So any uh, any editors uh, like ourselves who are worth their weight, uh, you know, we're not the experts here, uh, especially on this topic. So uh, we do know the folks who are the experts and we've got two experts with us today and uh, they are the duo of uh, Megan Owens and Jessica DeGraff. They are in the top. Let me see if I can point to them up there. Say hi. Hi. Guys. How are you guys? Great. Doing well. Awesome. And where are you? Cold, snowy Michigan. So we wish we were in St. Lucia as well, but it's not <laughs> right. Cold and snowy all around, right? Okay, so before we get going, uh, we have a couple of uh, housekeeping issues uh, webinar-wise uh, for our audience. Uh, the first one is, I was actually uh, uh, jumped ahead a little bit, but the first one is we have live help. Uh, so if you find yourself having some trouble, just look for the help button or the help menu somewhere on your screen. I don't know exactly where it is on your screen. Um, uh, uh, but if you run into any sort of webinar trouble, that is where you go. So if you're like if you need other sorts of help, like getting stuck out of a or getting out of a snowbank or tax help or something like that, uh, that's not what that's there for. It's for webinar stuff. Uh, this one. This slide is for questions. We have a question area somewhere again on your screen. Now, this is for general questions. Uh, actually, all sorts of questions, but for general questions, we'll hold off on answering those until the end um, of the webinar. Uh, if it's something that's a little bit more uh, apropos to the conversation that's actually taking place right then and there, uh, we'll throw those to Jessica and Megan as they come. And for technical questions, webinar questions, things like that, Chris Beatty's will make himself useful and answer those. And one more click of a slide here. Uh, the webinar will be archived. So if your time on this webinar somehow runs short, maybe you have a customer, uh, maybe there's a technical glitch, or maybe you just are really hungry for a sandwich and you just can't, uh, you know, uh, make it all the way through. Rest assured that this webinar uh, will be available to you for future viewing. Just go to that website, growertalks.com slash webinars, scroll down to the bottom of the page, and that is where you should find all of our past webinars. And I think that is it for the housekeeping. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to uh, Jessica and Megan. Great. Thanks, Ellen. Um, thank you guys for, for joining us today. Megan and I are super excited to, to be here and to talk about retail trends. Um, our role at Proven Winners is to work with independent garden centers, and we're traveling all over the U.S. and Canada 
uh, visiting with independent garden centers. And so a part of our role really is to uh, spot new trends, um, to give you guys really great examples and places where you can go to find those trends, and then also build programs and tools to help you guys capitalize on those. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. So about three years ago, uh, we created an advisory board of independent garden centers from across the U.S. and Canada um, of various size and geographic representation. And the idea of creating this board was really to help us to um, not only spot trends, but to develop programs and marketing and tools that really support the independent garden center as a whole. And so, um, you know, this group has been really, really integral in the formation of a lot of programs and tools that we have. Um, we're really thankful for the, the group of folks that help us with this, uh, with this board, and we meet twice a year. So if you ever have questions, if you ever have things that you would like us to look at with the group, uh, email Megan or I at any time. And what we really love about working with this group, um, you'll notice from the names up there, is the diversity as far as different regions of the U.S. and Canada, and also different size garden centers. So we know that different um, garden centers have different needs, but we can all learn from each other um, that we're doing different things in the store. Um, and, and we have great conversations in these meetings. So we're, we feel really, really lucky to be working with these, these great garden centers and hope that the information we get, we can share with um, all of you and, and really make this more and more of a valuable resource as it grows. So Megan and I get a lot of questions before we get into trends about really what is Proven Winners doing to educate consumers and, and how are we marketing? And so one of the things that we wanted to share with you guys, and we're really excited about this, is that in 2019, our goal is to have 2 billion consumer impressions. And so the chart that you see on your screen kind of captures and outlines where we're, we're building those impressions, whether that's um, through digital ads or through social media or with our partnership with Garden Answer, um, really working very hard to educate the consumer about the brand and about specific varieties. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but the one big thing that we wanted to point out is with every brand impression, um, whether it's a photo, whether it's an audio ad, the call to action is always look for proven winners in that white branded container. So we feel it's our best piece of POP and it's the best way for you guys to maximize what we're doing in terms of, of marketing uh, for 2019. And as you'll see um, from this presentation and as we go through and talk about trends and, and reaching your customers, um, if you can, you see that circle and see the, the big orange digital ads and how much social media and how much focus we're doing on some of that, um, we're following those trends as well. Um, and so that that's really our focus. We're up talking to you about what we're seeing and we're also marketing towards those trends as well. So today we're gonna to talk a little bit about a few different types of trends. We'll start with design trends uh, first and then we'll move into more consumer trends that you guys can capitalize on. So uh, the, the first place that we wanted to kind of mention to you guys, a great resource for information every single year is the Garden Media Group. They put together a Garden Trends Report and this is done by Katie Duo and her team. Um, and it's just a fantastic resource. If you have not read this, um, I would really encourage you to go to their website, download a copy, um, and they put that together every year. And these are great um, trends and tips and, and things that are really relevant to our businesses uh, moving forward each and every year. So we'll, we'll use a few of the slides uh, from the Garden Media Group and we'll give them credit as we go through. Um, but again, if you'd like to see more information from them, we'd highly recommend you guys go to their website and, and download that report. Another really great resource for information is Pinterest. Um, you know, I know some of you have Pinterest accounts for your businesses, some of you have them personally, but Pinterest is really the place where over 250 million people from around the globe go to find new ideas and also um, information on how to, to try something new. And each year Pinterest puts together a top 100 report that comes out usually in December. Um, lots of great information on a number of, of different topics from home to uh, parenting to actual, um, you know, interior design. And so what Megan and I have done in the presentation is we've kind of taken that list of 100 and kind of pared it down to five things that we think you guys can really utilize from that report. And then I know a lot of you guys have heard about Pantone. We've talked an awful lot and you've seen it in, whether it's in, in magazines or uh, in press releases, you've seen an awful lot about the Pantone color of the year. Uh, the color this year is Living Coral. Uh, Pantone is, has done a color of the year for the last 20 years, um, and really what that's focused on is trends that they're seeing in design, uh, industrial design, and fashion, and in a number of other industries. But one of the things that I think we often forget to talk about is it's not just the Pantone color of the year, which is living coral. They actually put together complementary colors and color palettes um, for you guys to, to 
capitalize on those. And some of those things are, are very nature centric this year. So you'll see living coral, but you'll also see a lot of shades of green. And I think we can really capitalize on those. Um, and this graphic that we're showing you um, is just some proven winter's plants that fit the mold and are in that living, co living coral color space. Um, we have a lot of social media graphics that we can share with you that are centered around the Pantone color of the year. Um, if you're following um, and getting our retailing newsletter, uh, we did put up a link to some of those graphics, but you'll get our information at the end. And if there's something that you'd like emailed to you that you'd like to be sharing with your customer about getting them excited about the living coral and the colors that they're seeing, um, just reach out to Jess and I and we'd be happy to get you those graphics. We also have the Pinterest page that also gives some ideas and inspirations on um, using living coral in the Pantone color of the year. Um, something interesting Jess and I saw, though, was bare paint, actually, instead of, they actually picked their own color of the year. Um, and I think it's very, very well thought out because maybe most people in their entire living room, I mean, I like to keep up with trends like the next person, but, you know, there, there's only so much you can do in a year, and by the time... <laughs> By the time you got used to that color, you're going to paint it again for next year. Okay. So what we really liked is that Bear actually picked this complementary color of blue that works great with the living coral color, but also um, works well with some of the yellows and greens that you're seeing a lot on Pinterest as well that are trending. So seeing how other industries are kind of playing off that, and when it doesn't fit their mold, um, using the Pantone color of the year and the trends that are happening in fashion and in other industries and capitalizing on that, I think is a, a page that we can, in our industry, you know, something that we can borrow and, and take that idea and concept and move it forward so that it works for our industry. So let's talk a little bit about Pinterest. Um, so I had mentioned earlier that we took that top 100 report and we kind of broke it down into five things that we really think that you guys can apply um, in, in your individual businesses. And so the first thing is what, what they're calling chalk couture. And so uh, it's really funny. And you can't go anywhere now without seeing chalkboard signs, chalkboard arts. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's all over Pinterest. And so one of the things that we would really highly recommend is take advantage of that. You know, often you've got, maybe you're very talented with chalk. Maybe you've got a staff member that's very talented with signage. Um, if you don't have somebody at the store level that can do that, um, a great idea is to reach out to a local artist and say, hey, would you come in, do some signage for us um, and just help us to capitalize on, on that specific trend. Um, we also, we know we live in, in, basically we're in a greenhouse space and so there's moisture, right? So if there are those of you that don't want chalkboard signs, but you want something that's a little more um, long-term, what we also do is we can actually work with you to create signage, coral blast signage that looks like a chalk style paint, um, but isn't necessarily a, a traditional chalkboard. So um, just to give you some idea, the search, search percentage increase is 664% uh, higher than last year on chalk style. So this is something that people are really excited about. And we're going to share at the end of um the webinar, we'll share some resources with you. And in our retail resource guide, we have some examples uh, that you can look at of, of what some of our uh, retail customers have done in the past season or so utilizing that that chalkboard concept and how it's worked for them. And, and those are ideas and concepts that have to work on if that's something, a look that would work in your garden center. So the next thing is, is uh, basically creative cacti is what they're calling it. And so we know there's been a huge succulent trend, but what's really interesting on Pinterest over the last year is that searches for succulents themselves have kind of waned. Um, but what they're seeing is a huge increase. The only succulent that's still increasing is cacti. And so um, what we're seeing is basically um, cactus being used and sold individually or also um, being used as sort of a centerpiece in a mixed container with other succulents. So this is a great category um, that would be very easy for you guys, I think, to capitalize on. Um, you have anything else? Um, well, something else that we've seen, and actually, oh, I didn't want to go backward. I, Something else that we've seen that's been um, really interesting and exciting has been uh, paper beats paint or wallpaper. Um, and that's, you know, one of those trends, everything that's old, that's new, you know, would I put wallpaper, would I think of putting wallpaper up in my house five years ago? I still don't know that I can do it, but uh, but now you're seeing all those great accent walls and using small space and, and using, and a lot of times using the tropical leaves or some plant themed um, looks to really make a wall pop or make a space feel like the outdoor coming in. So that trend actually um, is up by 401% um, in this past year, as far as searches for wallpaper ideas. Additionally, ceramics, um, you know, that clay pot 
folks are getting back into that again. Again, we're just kind of coming around to the old is new um, or the, the trusty the trusty thing that, that we are used to and we think of as traditional. Um, there's still appeal and the folks that are on Pinterest and using it for ideas are searching out ceramic pottery as well. And that's up 475% uh, in searches from, from the year before. Yeah, and last but not least is really that the vertic vertical gardening. So they have, Pinterest is calling it grow up the wall. And so vertical gardening has been really popular over the last four or five years. But I think when we start looking at the new demographic of consumer, they've got limited space. Where are they going to go with it? They've got to go up. And so there's a great opportunity, I think, to capitalize um, with vines, things like pothos or ivy that you can use inside. You know, if you want to think about outdoors, things like thunbergia or clematis, I think vines are going to be um, trending much higher as well. And so we're seeing search increases on vertical gardening of upwards of 300%. So it's, it's definitely a growing category. Just so to interject talking. just for a second. Um, one thing I wanted to point out uh, when I was at America's Mart in uh, January, I saw a lot of what you guys are talking about there in a lot of the home decor uh, showrooms. They're using all of this as sort of like, you know, to, to sell their own products that aren't necessarily plant related, but home decor related. Yeah. Yeah. We, have a we, also, we also had a question uh, come in from uh, Malia. Malia. Uh, will the top five Pinterest uh, things that you just mentioned be available at the end of this webinar? And I uh, believe she could probably get her hands on those. Yes. Yeah. Um, we'd be happy to send the presentation. Um, I know it's archived at the end as well, but if anyone wants additional information, mm -hmm. email Megan or I. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to move into some trends that Megan and I are seeing kind of out on the road. And so the first one that I wanted to talk about is this whole concept of urban jungle. And it's kind of funny. I was talking to my dad about this webinar, and he said, what in the world is an urban jungle? I have no idea. And so I was kind of talking to him about this whole idea of, you know, indoors is the new, excuse me, yeah, indoors is the new outdoors. And so 90% of our time as Americans is spent inside, whether that's work, um, you know, with kids, with events going on. And so... I think there's a, a big disconnect, um, you know, whether we're living in an urban area or we're just simply not connected to nature. You know, there's a lot of folks that are looking for ways to incorporate plants into um, what they're doing. And I know over the last four or five years, we've heard an awful lot um, from folks saying, hey, listen, the millennials aren't gardening in, in the traditional gardening sense. And so one of the things that Megan and I are really um, excited to, to read about is the fact that in 2016, when you look at that national gardening survey, of the 6 million new people that are actually gardening, 5 million of those folks are millennials. And so I think it's not that millennials aren't gardening. It's just that they're not gardening like their predecessors did. And we have to talk about how do we really um, connect with those folks. And so um, we've heard a lot about this term plant parents. And again, I told my dad this and I, I thought he was going to hit the floor. He's like, what, what's a plant parent? And I said, you know, this is, this is part of the Garden Media Group uh, Trends Report. And a plant parent is really, um, you know, very similar to, you know, four or five years ago when there's a huge increase of adopting cats or dogs. You know, a lot of these, uh, millennials, frankly, don't own their own homes and they're renting space. They may not be able to have animals in that space. And so a plant is a way to have a living, breathing thing that they can nurture and take care of. And uh, the houseplant craze is not going away. Um, tropicals, succulents, I mean, these are all things that I think were even past levels that we were at in the 1970s. And so it's really exciting to see um, how this is moving. The other thing is, is a wellness craze. Um, you know, when you start thinking about plants within spaces, um, I just think uh, we look at, you know, how they clean the air. We look at the greening. We look at mental um, well-being. And I think that's not going to go away. And millennials actually account for almost 40 percent of houseplant sales. So it's a category that we definitely uh, need to, I think, continue to build. And, and Megan's got some great examples that she's going to show you here um, from some retailers that are doing a great job incorporating houseplants into their displays. So here, this display is actually, it's from Mobux, um, and they've actually created, I believe they call it the Wedge, Jess, mm -hmm. Jess works with these folks. Um, they've created a whole space within their garden center, really dedicated to this bringing plants inside um, and bringing the outside in um, and just looking at a space as, as you're looking at this and they're sharing the pictures. I mean, that, that's a space that people, that people want to be in and they're creating these vignettes within the store. Um, another thing um, is kind of this whole craze with house plants and, and the Pilea craze. And, and if you guys have seen that and the whole plant sharing and giving a piece of your plant to others, um, that's also been a trend that that's something that we don't haven't seen with maybe traditional outdoor plants that we're seeing as, 
as folks are, you know, sharing this and want to get their friends into these things. Um, Jess will talk a little bit more about some of the new trends she's seeing coming um, on the houseplant side and some of the things that seem to be really picking up some speed out, kind of capitalizing on this, this house trend, houseplant movement. So the sill, I know we've talked an awful lot about the sill. Ellen, I think you guys mentioned it actually in, in some of the, the green profit stuff that you guys have done. This is a great website, guys. They've got a storefront in Brooklyn, New York, but they're also selling a lot online. So this is a company that I, I go there once a week to just to see what they're promoting. Mm -hmm. and the tagline is plants make people happy. And I'm like, how great is that? Mm -hmm. So they're doing a fantastic job, I think, of engaging a new customer. And so I just love to see what are they selling? And then also check them out on Instagram, check them out on Facebook and see how their customers are interacting with them because there's a ton of great ideas to be mined from that, um, that organization. <coughs> In addition to that, um, if you guys are familiar with Urban Jungle Bloggers, um, this is uh, the, the couple that kind of started this. They're friends. Their names are Igor and Judith, um, and they put together a blog. I subscribe to the blog. It's a lot of great information, but they also have a fantastic Instagram site. Um, really what they're and so a lot of it is um, design and styling, but a lot of it also is talking about wellness and, and health and things of that nature. So if you're not following Urban Jungle Bloggers, they're definitely somebody that we would really encourage you guys to take a look at as well. So I know you guys all want to know what the next top houseplant is for 2019. I know Pylea has been just huge in 2018, and we're all praying that Fiddly Fig might be kind of making its way out. Uh, Never. Uh, I know, I know. But, you know, some things that we're really showing as far as um, what folks are styling with. So banana palm has been very popular. Any of the monstera plants, uh, they're also known as Swiss, Swiss cheese plants. Monstera deliciosa is, is probably the most popular. You see that. Um, there's a whole hashtag monstera Monday is a, a huge thing on Instagram right now. Um, the other thing is, is the photo on the far right is what, what they're calling a fishbone cactus. And we're seeing that at a lot of, a lot of stores. Um, but what's really, really kind of fun, and I think is a great opportunity for us, is if you take a look at the photo in the center, they're calling those things plant squads. So instead of selling one plant, a prayer plant, for example, what they're doing uh, on Instagram and what you're seeing a lot of these folks, influencers really using, are groupings of plants together. So I think this is a great way as a garden center for you guys to, A, merchandise, um, you know, plants that have maybe it's similar care or similar light levels that they require, but it's also a great way to sell not just one plant, but five or six plants at, at one yeah. time. So um, definitely look up plant squads. There's a lot of great information on Instagram on those as well. And obviously that using that squad terminology that really resonates with some of the customers and, and the folks that we're trying to hit who are going to understand having their girl squad or, <laughs> or all their other squads. Now they've got their plant squad. So yeah. The mod squad. The yes. mod squad. Got it. <laughs> yeah. So we talk a lot about Facebook, and, and Facebook is a great tool. And, and if you've heard Jess and I, you know, talking in the last few years, we we are talking a lot in, about how you guys are using Facebook, what kind of content you're using, and really trying to support you. But if you're not using Instagram, um, and we're trying to reach a new demographic and reach the millennials and the generation coming up through there, we really um, need to start embracing Instagram. And the case for Instagram, it's so visual. Um, it's, you know, you, sometimes on Facebook, people have gotten turned off by getting into, you know, maybe topics and politics and things that they don't, you know, that, that they're not viewing as time and enjoyment. But going on and looking at pictures and being inspired by what their friends or their favorite influencers or their favorite stores or favorite you know, whatever it is, getting getting really inspired by those things um, it seems to be a more enjoyable experience and obviously something that folks are gravitating to. Um, and just the numbers you can see, there's more than 4 billion people, 4 billion likes per day on Instagram and each day um, and 23% more engagement. And we'll show you a couple examples of what our um, what we're seeing retail customers doing to engage in Instagram. And it's not so much putting up you know, content or putting up a pretty picture, but it's kind of taking that next step and, um, you know, asking some questions. Uh, there's a great example here. Um, Mulbax, you know, is asking, name that plant, you know, and, and other examples where they're at, the sills asking folks to share um, some of their pictures or share some ideas of what they're doing with plants this weekend. And I know I clicked by it fast and, and going backwards doesn't always work great, but, um, 
there are a lot of different Instagram sites that we'll share with you and can get you the information um, that we think you should be following. We know a lot of you guys have great pages as well. Um, but we, we've shown some examples, but there's a lot out there to just really get on and be inspired by, but also learn a little bit about how um, other people within our space and in other, you know, other retailers and other, you know, industries, fashion, how they're using Instagram to really connect with their customers um, and just a really great way to engage your followers rather than just putting information out there, asking for some information back. Um, we'll talk a little bit later about you know, how you share resources and, and this generation and this that we're that we're talking to when we look at millennials, um, they're really very used to content sharing and idea sharing where maybe we're hesitant, like, hey, we don't want to, you know, steal somebody's idea or put something up. I mean, you can tell from this presentation and you'll see from some of the pages we're, we're referencing, it's all about sharing other people's ideas you know, giving, absolutely giving people credit, but showing how others are inspiring you. Hashtags, you know, sometimes that seems like overwhelming. Oh my gosh, like there's 86 hashtags here. What is that all about? But once you kind of get a hang of that and and see how that helps with trending, um, it really does become second nature and it becomes a really, really great tool for you to use. So I guess I just, with any of these ideas, you know, don't be afraid to, you know, what is it? duplicate with, um, <laughs> you know, it, it's a great form of flattery to say, I love your idea and I want to do something similar. And I, I really think that's something we're seeing a lot more of um, with Instagram generation. Yeah, we've got great hashtag ideas. Um, you know, some of the biggest ones that are growing right now are the hashtag girls with plants or boys with plants. Um, botanical is a big one. So if you guys have questions on, you know, how to use the hashtags, what are some great ones to start incorporating to try to get a new audience? We can help with that as well. Absolutely. We do have a couple questions coming in about Instagram. Sure. Uh, Allison is uh, saying that they love Instagram for their garden center, but um, she wants to know some more tips. Uh, it's hard to know if that's connecting with customers local to us or from random plant lovers around the globe when they're using the hashtags. Um, any tips for getting it more local to them? So we can definitely do that. We actually have a woman in our organization, Susan, that manages our Instagram accounts. And so she's got some really helpful tips there. A lot of times if you can use hashtags that are, are very, um, so for example, I live in Grand Rapids. So if I, I use the hashtag Grand Rapids, that often will pull, or plants in Grand Rapids, that'll pull a lot of local customers. Um, if Allison would, would send us an email when she's done, Jen, what we can do is send her some <laughs> tips on that as well. Okay. And then uh, Jessica is asking for people unfamiliar with Instagram, does it have ways to do ads or reach people in your area like Facebook? So a little bit of what you talked about, or is sure. it just follower based? So, um, you know, and to that degree, I don't know a ton. As I said, Susan manages all of our Instagram. Megan and I love it, but we don't have to do the, the ins and outs of, of Instagram. So what we can make sure we do is connect Jessica and, and Susan can answer some, some of those pertinent questions that mm -hmm. she has as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so we're going to move on to, you know, the third trend that we're seeing a lot of, and that's that whole outdoor trends. And so, you know, we talked a little bit about indoors as new outdoors, but I do believe that, and Megan and I have talked an awful lot about this, is that there's a huge amount of opportunity really still with that outdoor area. When you think about, you know, growing up, um, you know, we had deck space and that was about it. We really didn't use the outdoor area as, as a way to engage, as a way to uh, you know, we never had a fireplace, we never had a, a pizza oven, and we never had a, a place to really congregate outside. And I think that's going to continue to grow. And so what we're seeing are some trends within that sort of outdoor theme. And the first one is really this concept of eco-friendly and native gardens. Um, you know, homeowners today, if you have if you have a house, the likelihood that you have a lot of time to be able to spend outside to actually garden or to take care of that um, is, is probably very small. And so what we're seeing is a huge trend with designers, with homeowners, with consumers basically coming to the Proven Winners website saying, hey, I want low maintenance plants and I want native ar native plants or native cultivars, things that I can basically plant them and forget them, mm -hmm. and shrubs. And so I think that's a great opportunity for us um, as we're thinking about solutions for consumers mm -hmm. of as we're categorizing plants, instead of listing them, the perennials A to Z, maybe we have an area that's that's eco-friendly or native. I know there's a number of garden centers that do um, do actually uh, have native categories, but I think we need to start thinking about how we merchandise by solution because, mm. frankly, people just don't have the time. And so this, is, I think, is going to be a big trend that is not going to go away anytime in, in the near future. 
The other thing with outdoor spaces, and I know the photos that you see on the screen are kind of more indoor focused, but they're um, kind of that room that basically transitions from the inside of your home to the outside of the home. And one of the, the companies that we follow, I love going to sites in Australia because they're, I guarantee you, they're three years ahead of us in terms of trends. And so there's a site called Homely, so H-O-M-E-L-Y. And it's actually a real estate company, similar to like, um, you know, one of our real estate companies here, but they have a ton of outdoor trends. And so one of the things that they are talking an awful lot about is texture in 2019. So you're going to see a lot of outdoor furniture that's maybe wicker or rattan style furniture or very basic, uh, simple organic kind of prints. But what they're really encouraging is incorporate a lot of texture. So consumers are looking for bright colors. Maybe it's that living coral color or, or some of the yellows on Pinterest. Um, the other really big thing that they're talking about with texture is macrame. I know there are some of you cringing right now thinking about macrame, but it's not just for inside for houseplants. It's also incorporating that into the outdoor space as well. Uh, and last but not least is this whole idea of growing your own. And I know there's been a lot of talk about, you know, vegetable gardening, uh, you know, the whole Victory Garden kind of renewed that, that whole concept um, a number of years ago. And I don't know if any of you guys are, are familiar with the two gentlemen on the screen, but they actually have a show with the BBC called Garden Rescue. Check it out. Like, these guys are really good. Um, it, their names are David and Harry Rich. And one of the things that they are really working on, and we're seeing it a lot in Europe, is really the utilization of vegetables and herbs and what we call ornamental edible plants. So maybe you can eat the flowers or uh, maybe it's a strawberry that you have flowers, but you also get the fruit out of. Um, they're really using a lot of these plants and they're incorporating them into these outdoor spaces. So the next slide that you guys are going to see is just a, a snapshot. Um, we put together a booklet every year and we'll talk about this in more detail later called mm. Carter's Idea Book. And so what we really tried to do with this spread is really style and show, okay, here's a great idea for an outdoor kitchen. And this is how you can actually incorporate tomatoes and basil and strawberries and other edibles uh, or ornamentals rather into, into the space. And so it's, it's a huge category. I think we need to start merchandising instead of it just being vegetables in a space or herbs in the space, really starting to show people how they can use these in their outdoor areas and, and creating more of a lifestyle set to sell them. So another, um, popular trend that we're seeing is cultivating mindfulness. And, you know, as we talk about the work home life balance um, and you're seeing huge increases in folks going on and searching ways to um, create more mindfulness and reflection in their homes and in their lives um, and plants, obviously we know are a great way to improve that environment and bring that into your home. Um, and, and again, as we talk about the gardener's idea book um, and some things that, that we've been looking at, um, here are just some examples of how we've created some scenes that become your own Zen area in your yard um, and, and amongst your plants and how you create yourself a, a peaceful area that you can go um, and take that time and really reflect and enjoy and relax in your space. Um, and what I've loved is how some of our customers and some of the retailers we work with have gone and, and taken that mindfulness um, concept and brought it into their garden center. And these pictures are actually from um, Serbo Garden Center in Parsippany, New Jersey. And last year they started a yoga in the greenhouse. Um, I think they did three or four evenings um, throughout the summer. So if you like that hot yoga, um, <laughs> You got you got that you got that effect, um, but you can just see from the pictures it was it was a great event. It was bringing in different customers, getting them new customers, and really doing nothing more than just making a little bit of space so that people could lay down a mat. But using that that environment and atmosphere that they already have um, to create a new use um, for the garden center, and in turn bring new customers in who maybe had never seen been into their facility or, or weren't plant shopping to see all the beautiful things that they have as well. Um, and, and really connecting the mind to the plants. Um, so I, I loved this idea. This has been one of my favorite that I've seen out and about. Um, but again, these are, these are things that we encourage um, and we'll talk more and more about just how we encourage, you know, connecting with the community um, and that being a really great way to, to reach some of these new customers and demographics that we're talking about. You know, the last big trend that we've been seeing an awful lot of out and about, whether it's in our industry or in others, is this idea of resource sharing or influencers. And so obviously, I know many of you are very familiar with Laura from Garden Answer on the screen here, and she's showing our, our annual of the year, which is sedum lemon coral. Um, we know that a lot of you guys struggle in peak season. Um, not everyone has a marketing department, and so you're wearing a lot of hats. And so, um, you know, we're really working to create engaging and exciting content uh, for social media, uh, for video, for your website. 
um, that you guys can be sharing. And so we wanted to share just some of the things that we're doing um, along that vein that you guys can take advantage of. So Megan's going to talk a little bit about our National Plant of the Year program. So our National Plant of the Year program started a few years ago. And initially, you know, we had our annual of the year, which was a lemon coral that Laura was was holding up. Um, and we had a landscape plan of the year um, and then also a perennial of the year. But working with our retail advisory board, um, we got feedback from them that no, kind of knowing what we were focusing on in our advertising really helped them to reach their customers and, and really capitalize on the marketing that Proven Winners does. So we've expanded that into a host of the year. We have a rose of the year, but we really expanded the program um, so that we can help you with graphics we and, and things that Laura's talking about. You're able to take that and bring that to your garden center, share Laura's videos, um, and use some of the marketing that's already created for you. As I said, we know how hard it is to get content. Um, so these graphics are, are up and ready for your use. Um, we can definitely connect you um, to a library of social media graphics that are ready for you to use and optimize for Facebook and Instagram. Um, so use us as a resource for these. Um, and again, just kind of knowing what Laura is talking about is so helpful. And take those videos and share them. That, that's absolutely what that content's for. Um, so use that as a resource. And we also try to talk about the National Plants of the Year very, very far in advance. Um, we'll start talking at CAST in March um, with, our, with grower customers and broker customers about what the plants of the year will be for 2020 so that the word's out, so that we make sure what we're talking about is things that you're able to have in your garden center um, so that we can really make a happy consumer who sees something that they like online and, and goes to your garden center and is pleased um, with, with what they find and take home. <laughs> So we do have a, a print campaign and we do a lot of, of print with uh, a lot of our proven winners, color choice shrubs. But one of the things, so I grew up in the garden center and I remember, um, you know, growing up as a kid, you'd, you'd have four or five customers that would come in on a Saturday morning asking for some really obscure or new plant. And by about the fifth customer, you realize that Martha Stewart had talked about it on her show. <laughs> Nothing more frustrating than not having it. And so then you're trying to sub with something else. And so to Megan's point, we're really trying to work with the National Plants of the Year and also with our print um, campaigns um, way, way in advance. So, for example, on the on the shrub print campaigns, basically we have that scheduled for both 2019 and 2020. So you guys know what's going to be promoted in the various magazines. You can make sure that you have them in store. Um, the other thing that we've done, I love this this ad campaign that we've done. Um, it's, it's kind of a, a total um, kind of about face from our traditional ads in that uh, it's very focused on a, a keyword, and then you'll see, you know, I love this, the, the show-off firelit hydrangea ad with the peacock. I think it's just yeah. kind of something completely different. And so the one, one of the really cool ways that you guys can take advantage of that, we can give these to you to use as social media graphics. Or if you want to create signage in the store that matches what your customers are seeing in the magazines, they can take advantage of that as well. So we want you to know what's coming. We want you guys to be able to, to really be able to promote and have those plants because there's nothing worse than getting somebody excited and then you can't sell them, you know, the plants because you don't have it. Jessica, are those available on the website, on your Proven Winners website? They are not on the website, Jen. So if, if customers want them, if they would email Megan or I, we can make sure that we get them to them. Yeah. And okay. uh, at the end of the slideshow, uh, we will have your um, email addresses uh, listed so people can uh, email you directly. Perfect. Yes. Thank you. Just letting people out there know. Awesome. So another resource um, that we have is our Gardener's Idea Book. Um, and our Gardener's Idea Book is an inspiration piece. If you're not familiar with it, we have about half a million folks that get on, consumers that will get on our website and request a gardener's idea book um, each season. So it is something that our dedicated customers have come to expect. It's, it's a piece that really shows, as we showed you some examples of some pages and some spreads, there's really some inspirational ideas for gardening. Um, and we also work very closely with our wholesale customers and our retailers to let you know well in advance of what we're gonna be featuring in the gardener's idea book. A lot of times, a lot of the national plants of the year and and plants that um, the consumers will be able to find. Um, we, we try to get all that information to you early so that you're prepared as the customers are bringing in the gardener's idea book to Jessica's point about Martha Stewart. We don't want them to come in with a gardener's idea book and, and for you to be surprised. And I think we get better and better at doing that every year. Um, but it's a great resource. We do have the Gardener's Idea books available if it was something that you wanted to bring in as, as something to have in your garden center for an event or a giveaway. Again, we keep saying this, but reach out to Jess and I. Um, we can give you some details about 
how you can use that resource. Um, we also have a version available um, online. So if you're um, not mailing things out or, or having the hard copy doesn't really fit what you do in your store, we do have a flipbook version that will be available for you to, you could share on your website or send out in an email, however that works best for you. Um, but again, we just really want to inspire consumers uh, to, to be do, following some of these trends and, and really making plants more and more a part of their uh, daily lives. Additionally, with the Gardener's Idea Book, there's a um, partner website to that called Proven Beauty. And that is great because it takes the next step. Um, so you're seeing some of these inspirational ideas and you're like, that looks fantastic. How do I do that? And that's what Proven Beauty can really help with is how do you create these spaces um, and how do you do some of these things that you're seeing um, take great pictures, but how, how do I make that actionable? And Proven Beauty gives even more inspiration and some great ideas on, on how to make those work at home. We have a question uh, that came in from Cheryl um, asking, is the Proven Winners Google Doc for social media graphics still an active resource for shareable content? Yes. If she can wait a couple of slides, we'll talk about it. Oh. She's foreshadowing. <laughs> Good job, Cheryl. Awesome. You know, the other cool thing about Proven Beauty, um, you know, it allows consumers to kind of recreate what they're seeing in the Gardener's Idea Book. I think a great opportunity for an independent garden center, though, is take one or two of those projects and actually do an event in store. If you have all the plants, you've got the pottery, you've got all of the pieces to kind of pull that together, it's a great way to bring in some of your customers and say, hey, maybe you're not comfortable doing this at home, but we can really help you to recreate this. <laughs> project. So I want to talk a little bit about um, consumer trends. And, and one of the biggest things I think that we struggle with consumer trends is we always watch the consumers. And what we really need to be watching are the innovations and the products and the campaigns that are literally flooding the market. I think that's more important because um, technology is moving so fast that sometimes I think we as people are kind of slow to adopt uh, some of those things. Mm. So um, there's a there's a photo on the on the slide here that you'll see, and it's called IKEA Place. And if you guys have not um, downloaded this app, it's free. I know some people love IKEA, some people don't particularly care for IKEA. Um, my husband is one of those, <laughs> uh, but they have the coolest app. And what they're using is augmented reality or AR. And so if you guys aren't familiar, with that, literally what you do is you download the app on your phone or on your iPad or tablet. And what you can do, and you can see the the gentleman in the screen here. He's basically holding his phone up in his living room over this rug. And what Ikea allows him to do is pick the furniture that he would like to see in that space. So it's live in real time. So when you think about Pottery Barn or Crate and Barrel three or four years ago, what they were doing is you would upload a photo of your living room, let's say, and then they would give you, they'd have a designer look at the photo and they'd give you suggestions and they'd tell you, hey, we think you should purchase these specific items. With this augmented reality, what they're literally able to do is show you in real time what that what that chair is going to look like uh, in that space. And so I know that it's it's difficult in the horticulture industry and it's difficult for us to kind of think about that. But what we're really trying to get you guys to think about is the fact that, you know, we know people are looking online uh, well before they come into the store to make purchase decisions. And so these are the types of technology that we really need to be exploring moving forward to really engage that new customer. And, and talking a little bit about IKEA, I think they're one of the best um, in terms of how they how they retail. And, and I think there's a real fundamental shift that's it's occurring right now with consumer purchasing behavior. And the, and the biggest shift is, you know, in the last four or five years, it was all about information. You know, consumers want to know about the product. They research it before they come into the store. Or they buy it at brick and mortar. It's really easy to buy online. It's, it's actually quite easy to buy plants online now. And so it's not just about information. It's really about how do we give them the information on the front end to help them kind of start that purchase decision, but then also the experience in store. And I think IKEA has done a fantastic job on both ends of that spectrum um, from, you know, the initial point at which they're <laughs> grabbing that customer when they log onto the website to the point at which they're walking into, into brick and mortar. And I think Brick and mortar is hugely relevant. I think we have one of the best products out there and I think consumers are still gonna come in, but we really need to start thinking about how do we create experiences that are going to engage new customers. So let's talk a little bit about some demographics. And I know um, some people love demographics, some people don't care for them. And we've talked a little bit about millennials, but I wanna talk to you guys a little bit about Gen Z. And so a lot of people are like, okay, what does Gen Z actually even mean? What they are, they're folks in that, in that age category of about 15 to 21. Um, you know, Forbes says the average Gen Zer is 21. There's a little bit of fluctuation in terms of um, the actual age there. 
But these folks, these are kids that literally have grown up with a cell phone in their hand. They don't know a world before, you know, the iPhone, before technology. Um, and it was really funny. I was reading a quote, and you can see it at the bottom of the screen from Huffington Post, and they said that these are the people in the household that are the in, in-house tech experts. And it's, it's really hysterical because, you know, my mom will call me and ask my six-year-old to try to help her figure out who <laughs> She doesn't ask me. So we're looking at a younger demographic, and I know a lot of you guys are saying, well, why do we care? Because really, how much discretionary income does a 15 to 21-year-old have? And they don't have a lot right now, but what I'm going to tell you is that by you know 2025, between millennials and Gen Z, they'll make up more than 45% of the purchasing power. And we really need to start thinking about how are we interacting with these folks? You know, Gen Z is, is hyper-informed. They're online all the time. They're really not as influenced by price. They're more influenced by values. So they want something that's unique. They really want the experience, and they want something very innovative. And so we have to start thinking about, um, you know, how do we create an experience in store, you know, that, that kind of captures that demographic. And, and then when we move into millennials, it's, it's very similar um, in terms of what millennials really would like as well. Um, and we're flipping the slide here, bear with us. Um, you know, millennials already outnumber baby boomers. And I know some of us love millennials, some of us love to hate on millennials, <laughs> but the reality is, um, you know, they're, they're a huge portion of our business. And so um, the thing that I really like about millennials is they're very um, open to asking questions. They want information. They really like in-person um, conversations back and forth. They love video tutorials and idea generation. And so we have a great opportunity with a number of the tools, we have, whether it's you know video from Laura at Garden Answer, um, social media to really interact with these folks. And yes, they like to buy online, but the reality is, is they want to come in store and be able to validate that purchase with you or one of your associates. Um, really fun thing, if you guys look at the slide right now, um, they did a, a survey about nine months ago with millennials um, and they were asking them, how close uh, the nearest succulent was to them. And the vast majority, over 60% of those folks actually said that a succulent was within harm's reach. So this is a huge demographic and a huge opportunity for us moving forward. I also think the interesting thing with Gen Z, especially, um, and millennials for the most part, is that where we kind of look at that Amazon, everything gets there in two days, you know, but I never go into the grocery store anymore. <laughs> like all these things that I think are amazing because I remember and know the other side of it, where to them that's always, you know, that's not new or novel, that's what they've always done, and there's a lot of expectation around that. So, you know, what the online movement is, is here to stay, but as Jess said, on the other side of that, they've always done it that way, so these experiences and different things that we can do um, to get them out and to get them into the community, um, to get them asking questions, or something like, as a, the picture you see, a farm-to-table event that really gets them connected with, um, local restaurants and whether it be local breweries working this is from a garden center barlow's up in new jersey they had a farm to table event in their garden center and really brought a bunch of local folks um, and local merchants in and had a farm to table dinner um, made available some of the herbs and vegetables and things that they were using uh, made that available to the folks that were creating the dinner so then some of the folks that attended the event could go and buy and purchase these same wonderful tomatoes that they'd had at this event, um, really connecting the community, giving them an experience. Um, and I, I think these are the things that are, are great for any generation, um, but I really think that's something that speaks to the younger generations as they're coming through and that are finding that they're more connected with the buying local movement. I'm, I live in Portland, Maine, and, and for us, the the and I know with Jess and Grand Rapids, the, you know, local breweries, it's just taken off and, and, you know, one gets successful and gets a little bit big. And then that one is the, the sellout of the group and, and they want the next, they want to be on top of the next, the new one that they, that came from down the road. Um, and I think that we have a big opportunity um, as independent garden centers to capitalize on some of this connections that these folks that maybe haven't made a lot of personal connections um, because life is so digital for them. I think we can really capitalize on those opportunities. And another thing that I'm seeing a lot of folks doing, um, especially in um, the off season, uh, at this time of year when maybe they're not getting much traffic into the garden center, is really hosting some of these um, farmers markets and bringing in local artisans and merchants. Um, again, connecting everybody with the community. Maybe somebody 
really loves farmer's markets and has never, ever been to your garden center. And then all of a sudden you bring them in and there's a brand new customer for you. So I have a lot of garden centers that I've been out and talking to that are having a lot of success with this. Um, we'd love to share ideas. Again, those who have done it are really excited to share some of their successes and what they've learned. So if it's something that you think would work for you and you're looking for information on, again, um, Jess and I are happy to help and, and try to point you in some, some of the right directions to get some of these things going. So the biggest part of, of really connecting with those customers, though, whether it's Gen Z or millennials or, or others, for that matter, is really education. And I think that's uh, the first way to really um, to, to build education is we've got to educate our staff mm -hmm. first. An educated staff, you know, when, when you've got a, a staff member that is knowledgeable about a plant product uh, or a brand or a group of plants, they're, they become a, a brand ambassador. They're excited to sell the plants. You know, I, I can't tell you how many times I've gone into a home improvement store and people literally run away from you because they don't they don't have the answers and they're afraid to talk to customers. And so one of the things that we've done at Proven Winners is really work very hard to educate staff, your staff members, basically, through our certified training program. This is a program that we do every year. Uh, it's about 45 minutes in length. And the goal is not only to talk about our new plans, of course we want to talk about that, but one of the bigger things that we really try to do to give back to the industry is we track every single question that consumers come onto our website and ask. Um, and we're looking at, okay, what are the common problems that they're having? What are some great solutions that we can offer to this garden center staff to be able to help these customers find the right plant? Um, so the training program actually started February 1st and that runs through May 1st. Um, not only do you get free training and a free pizza party, everybody loves pizza, right? <laughs> uh, if, if you've got people that don't eat pizza, we'll work with you guys on sandwiches <laughs> or salads. Um, but one of the really neat things that we did is for years and years, we let every garden center that wanted to go onto our website, they could log on and they could basically um, designate themselves as a seller of Proven Winners product. One of the things that we're finding, though, is the number one reason people go on our website is to find a local source for Proven Winners. And so we want to connect them with you guys, with, with that independent garden center that's going to have a lot of information and be able to help them. And what we were finding is sometimes garden centers that were listed didn't necessarily sell a lot of Proven Winners product. And we were actually getting notes from consumers that were really frustrated saying, hey, guys, like I've been to four garden centers in this specific region. I can't find what I want. I'm frustrated. I don't have the time to do this. And so what we've done is we've kind of modified our find a retailer uh, section on the website. So if you guys, I know it's quite small, but if you look in on the, the graphic on the right hand side, uh, certified garden center is designated with the certified garden center logo. Um, and those garden centers that don't go through the program, basically they are still listed. You'll see their name, but you can't actually, the consumer can't click on that name to find out any more information about the retailer. But for example, a garden center that does certification they can click on your, your name. It gives them information about your business. Um, you can actually designate the people that they need to come in and talk to. It'll tell them how many of your staff members have gone through certification. The idea being that if you've taken the time to go through the staff training, educate your staff, we really want to make sure that we're directing customers to you. In addition, um, and I know I think it was Cheryl that had the question about social media graphics. Social media is another great way to educate customers. And when Megan moves to the next slide, we're going to show you guys um, we have a huge Google Drive library of uh, social media graphics. And so those are sized appropriately for the various um, platforms, whether that's Facebook or Instagram, um, you know, Pinterest, Twitter. Um, and that, that URL is at the top of the screen there. It's just provenwinners.com slash share. And so we have graphics on our new plans of the year. We have right now one of the more popular ones is the countdown to spring. I mean, who, who is it? My spring? favorite one. <laughs> Um, but some of them that we do are very educational based. And so the one I wanted to kind of point out is there's a graphic in the center of the screen called the know and grow. Series. Um, and that one, this specific photo is 10 shrubs for clay soil. And so what it is, is it's a graphic. Um, and then we'll provide you with a link to blog content that basically talks about those 10 shrub varieties um, that your customers can be buying. So you can either link to the Proven Winners website, or if you said, hey, guys, we really want that content, but we want to keep them on our specific website, we can provide that blog content for you. Um, another really great graphic, um, and we just flipped through, is the plant this, get this. I know, no, it's okay. There's a lot of customers that, um, my neighbor included, have no idea what a plant's going to do. She bought a Vista bubble gum, and she said, how do I take care of it? And I said, just feed it and water it. I gave her plant fertilizer. At the 4th of July, she calls me and says, come over to the house. And I'm like, oh, no, she killed it. I'm in trouble. <laughs> What I found out is she fertilized it every single day, and the plant was literally eating the mailbox. And so, she, <laughs> you know, when I when I bought it, I had no idea what it would do. And so that's kind of the concept of that plant. This get this. A lot of folks, even when they read the tag, 
three by three means nothing to them. And so we've got to give them a really good visual. And so we're trying to do more of the education, giving them visual um, and, and more information via social media as well. Um, the next big thing that we wanted to talk about, uh, write this one down. I love this website. It's called trendwatching.com. Okay. Love they, that place. Yeah, it's, they do really cool things. Um, they come up with a, a report every year. There's so many reports you can read about what's coming up. But one of the biggest things that I took away from their 2019 report was that we are now living in the expectation economy. And so people are, will say, well, what in the world is that? And basically what they're saying is, is consumers don't know what they want and they expect you to tell them what they want and what they need. I mean, how awesome is that at the garden center, right? Um, and so what they're really looking for is, is innovative ideas and experiences. And so they were talking about kind of the five basic human needs and then the two big things at retail that we really need to focus on. And the first one is delight. You know, meaningful experiences, um, whether it's employer-employee relationships or relationships with your customers are hugely critical. And so we've got to come up with ways that we can engage and delight that customer. And then the other thing is, is escapism. And we've talked an awful lot about this, and I, I never really thought about it. But think about the average American um, worker. A lot of people have a week to two weeks of vacation, and that's it. So we're stuck in, not stuck, but we're in these lives where, you know, we can't go away. We can't go to St. Lucia like we want to. Jen. <laughs> but we want to be able to go. only. I know. And we want to we want to work with businesses and go to these places that we can kind of escape our reality for a little bit of time. And so the boundaries between, you know, what we envision, and what we do, I think, are, are blurred quite a bit. And so your customers are looking for deeper engagement. So how can we make the garden center more reactive and relevant to those those customers? Because they're really expecting us to tell them um, what they need. And I think Megan can talk a little bit more about some of the things that we're really doing to, I think, help with that uh, engagement as well. Right. And I think it's important to note um, when we're talking about delighting the customer and the experience, again, as we're talking about all of our customer base, but especially as we talk about the millennial, um, the millennial generation and the Gen Z, is that they also are very big on sharing their experiences. And so that's something that I think we have to be more and more aware of is when they have a great experience, they'll get on and on your Yelp or whatever they're and they tell everybody how great it was. And when they don't. <laughs> They sure do that, too. So that's where we need to be a little bit more mindful. I think even we all want to service our customers, make sure they have a wonderful experience. But just keeping in mind that that there is constant sharing going on and, and that it's really, really critical that that these folks walk away and feel that they were taken care of and delighted, as Jess said. Yeah. Um, some of the things that we're doing um, is we're, one of the things is working with Garden Answer and and you guys are familiar with Laura it's been such a great partnership um, Garden Answer Laura and her husband Aaron produce a um, hundred videos a year for proven winners um, but she's got almost 60 million um, views on YouTube um, 370 million views on Facebook 2.5 million followers Jessica and I were just talking about this because we were you know as we're preparing for this presentation and looking up garden influencers it the amount uh, of Facebook followers Laura has for some of the lists that we saw it was just crazy staggering how much of a um, following that she has cultivated. Um, but what's really, really great about Laura, if you're not familiar with, with her, um, you should definitely follow her, um, is that she does some great projects that are very, very um, tangible and attainable um, and really speaks well to um, people who are maybe just getting into gardening. You know, there, there's been other influencers in the world that you see what they're doing and you think that's amazing, but I'm never pulling that off. And I, I think Laura makes it very real. Um, she's got a personality that that's very, very appealing and you kind of just feel like she's your friend um, sharing with you, you know, a project that she did. Um, I'd love it if sometimes she did like a Pinterest fail like <laughs> version, but I don't know that she has those, but mm -hmm. she does such a great job. Um, and the videos again are very consumable. So it's, she's focused on keeping their, the short videos, um, that really engage you, but give you great information as well. Um, so working with her is something that we really, really feel like has been great for us. And I think that we're bringing in new gardeners, um, every day, just from some of the work that Laura's doing. Um, Shoot, I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> Additionally, um, another thing with Laura, and I think we mentioned earlier, is that content, um, I believe we have a whole list um, up on our, our website of what she has 
videos that she's already produced over the last couple of years um, on different topics. So um, you don't need to wait and only share the videos that are just coming out. But if there's things that she's done on um, some products, Super Tunias, if there's different projects that you think would be interesting to your customer base, if you go to our website, um, to the Garden Answer page, you'll see a whole list and library of videos um, from past projects. And then as her new projects come out, those go up as well. And you have, you know, full uh, carte blanche to share those and use those as you see fit to, to promote proven winners in these projects in your um, in your garden center. And as Jess said, you know, if you're looking for a fun way to get folks engaged in the garden center event, an event um, kind of centered around one of those projects would be a really great way to take it from them searching online right into your garden center and, and making you the source for that, the happiness that that project brought them. Okay, so we're gonna move on to um, one of the other things that the Garden Media Group put together, um, and this was part of their trends, was this idea of, of breaking good and what they're calling um, kind of Gen Z and the millennials is sort of the new environmentalist or, or what they call golden hearts. And so these groups are really looking at the environment saying, okay, whether it's plastic straws or something else, they're looking at you know how do we leave a lasting legacy and make an impact you know, on our world. And so I think there's ways that in our industry we really need to start looking more at sustainability and how do we start communicating what we're doing with, with these new customers. And frankly, you know, even baby boomer customers, we're, we're living in a world where there's a lot of things that are happening. And so how do we do that? And I wanted to share a really cool um, company with you guys. I don't know if you have, uh, have seen these. Uh, it's called Allbirds, and they're a brand of, of tennis shoe, basically. And they started a few years ago. They're really cool. You can wash them. Um, they're really comfortable, super lightweight. But when I was digging and trying to find some things about kind of new open source solutions, Allbirds came up because one of the things that they're doing is every single tennis shoe has a foam sole, right? And one of the things that they had mentioned is when you start looking at all of those plastics that are washing up, you know, you see the photo of the ocean and you see all the all the plastic and the trash washing up on shore. The number one thing that you can pick out are flip flops, right? because they don't be a foam. So what Allbirds did is they worked with a, a local um, petrochemical company because basically foam is, is a byproduct of, of petroleum basically. And they said, all right, how do we create a sole that basically is biodegradable? And so after three years of research, they actually came up with, with what they're calling sweet soles basically. And so they've made a flip flop that's totally biodegradable. It's made out of sugar cane. And the really cool thing about this is uh, they're only 35 bucks. So, you know, check out Allbirds. I'm a shoe, I'm a shoe fanatic, <laughs> so I'm pretty excited about these. But the thing that we found really, really interesting about this, and I think we'll, which uh, the, the part of this that's really going to resonate with consumers is the fact that they made that recipe or that, that sweet, sweet foam sole available to everybody. Mm -hmm. If Nike wants to take that recipe, if someone yeah. in another industry wants to take that, they literally made that um, widely available because they really strongly feel that it's going to impact the environment and that there's a huge lasting impact that they can give back to our world and, and to, to us. Mm -hmm. It's very similar to, to like what Volvo did in the 50s with the three-point harness. I never knew that. Volvo actually was the first one to create the seatbelt, and so they felt like it was so... Um, important for, for from a safety perspective for people to utilize that, that they made the patent widely available. And so, you know, as we're thinking about our industry, you know, I think we need to start asking ourselves a few questions about, you know, and, and the radically simple questions is really, where are we making a positive impact? You know, and if we're making a positive impact, we need to be talking about that and, and educating our customers. Could we have an exponentially bigger impact if we actually shared what we're doing with one another? And I think that's that's huge. And what's really stopping us? You know, I, I think um, there's all the, the notions of competitive. <clears throat> that's a great thing. But at the end of the day, we live in a world where um, people are very loyal and they really want us to share and they want to make a positive impact. And so, you know, any of the, the short term wins that you would have um, from keeping that uh, competitive advantage, I think you lose in the long term. So I think we really need to look at how do we how do we create a lasting legacy? And so one of the things that we talk an awful lot about is plastics. You know, we use a lot of plastics in our industry. Maybe that's the first step, you know, and we start Start looking at alternate um, sources or options really at the garden center level. But I think we really need to start looking at how do we make a better impact, a lasting impact, you know, and how do we talk about that with our customers? So um, the next slide really is just kind of an overview. I know that's really small yeah. for the day. <laughs> but what it is is those are links to every single thing that Megan and I talked about today. So we'll make those openly available to you guys. Um, I know we covered a ton of information. We had a kind of a short period of time to do that. Um, but just sincerely wanted to thank you guys uh, for putting the time to, to 
sit here with us and listen to trends. Megan and I are always available. Absolutely. We love to talk. Um, <laughs> Ellen will put a slide up with our contact information. Feel free to email or, or call us anytime. Okay. Okay. Great. Great. Uh, before we close out, we have a couple of uh, lingering questions. Um, just a few that we have uh, some time for. Uh, Dave asks, uh, is radio advertising effective in reaching millennials or are they only engaged by social media channels? Um, something that we've done, I, I think possibly the terrestrial radio um, advertising is probably not an effective way to to meet meet that generation. But something that we've done at Proven Winners in the past um, year is working with the Pandora radio Ooh. ad campaign. So um, we think internet radio um, is definitely uh, the way that millennials and that generation are are listening to their music. Um, we yeah. looked at different options as far as you know Spotify versus um, Pandora, but what we find. Um, with Spotify is that a lot of those folks pay for the premium service and so they don't hear the commercials. Um, but what's really, really nice with the um, Pandora campaign that we have is for, for pennies per impression, um, we uh, can work with retailers within a 20 mile radius of their garden center to hit potential customers who identify themselves as garden enthusiasts. Um, they'll hear the ad, they'll see a logo um, that they can click through for more information, either to a social media page or to their website. Um, additionally, um, we get that feedback as far as um, who they were, as far as the impressions, what demographics they were hitting, and we can share that information with the garden center. Um, so that campaign, I believe, is um, $350 per um, six-week campaign. And um, it's just a really, really nice way to hit that demographic, but at the same, and we can make adjustments to that, which is really, really, one of my favorite parts about the campaign is that, that we can do some customizable things to it. Um, but really, it's something you don't get from print ads or terrestrial radio is finding out who's on the other side of that. Um, yeah. And if they're actually taking a next step um, to to actually find out more about your business. So um, that's something that customers, if they're looking to kind of dabble in some some affordable marketing for even this spring that we, we still have time to get people um, signed up on that. Um, that, that would be something I'd suggest. The voiceover is done by Laura at Garden Answer and she calls out the customer as call to action to go to XYZ Garden Center for their proven winners products. So you're mm -hmm. really getting your own Laura ad um, that, that mm -hmm. hits your region. So that's something that we're doing to try to keep up with um, really having effective marketing to, to, to that generation. Um, and we had really, really great feedback from it last year. That was kind of a pilot. So this year we're trying to hit it full throttle and there's still time to do that. Okay. Okay, good. And I know that uh, we're a little bit over on time. So just one more question. Two people asked uh, the same question uh, about where to go for more information about that staff training and how to become a certified uh, Proven Winners Garden Center. Sure. So if they log into the Proven Winners website, uh, there's a search bar at the very top. If you just type in certification, that program will pop up. Or if they'd like to just email Megan or I, um, uh, our email is actually, I think, on the next slide, Ellen. And so they're free to email us, and we'd be happy to send them a link to the video um, and also all of the additional information that they need to, to finalize that. Okay. Okay. And uh, I think that's all the time we have. We have a lot more questions, but uh, oops, let me do this. Uh, you guys, our audience, uh, feel free to uh, email Megan and Jessica at the uh, emails uh, addresses that you see on uh, the screen there. And uh, any any last comments from any of you guys? No, we just really, really appreciate the time. We have so much fun talking about this um, and we're gets us really jazzed up for spring and it doesn't feel like it's coming, but it sure is. So <laughs> fingers crossed. Um, so we really appreciate the time. Cool, great. Well, we appreciate it too. And a lot of people uh, actually uh, chimed in halfway through the uh, webinar asking, oops, I missed the first part. Uh, and if you missed the first part of this uh, uh, webinar, you can go to growertalks.com slash webinars and uh, probably within an hour or so and uh, find the archived version. So I think, I think that's it, right? Uh, and uh, that's it. So thank you so much, everybody. And um, so for myself and for Jen Polans and Megan and Jessica, so long. And hey, have a wonderful Valentine's Day, everybody. Goodbye. Goodbye.